we start. So talk about failure criteria. This is the failure criteria for isotropic materials. As you can see, the Valmises on the left and the Tresca on the right. And this is the traditional uh, isotropic materials. And for orthotropic materials, this is what we'll talk about, that we use for composite materials. We usually, with five failure strength, uniaxial tension, uniaxial compression along the zero direction, along the transverse direction, and shear. So it is usually based on the five strength parameters from which you do the curve fitting for the failure criteria. So the options are clear. First, there's a maximum stress criterion, and you can just use the, the three planes. You have the sigma x, sigma y, and also the sigma shear versus sigma y, and also the shear versus sigma x. So there are three orthogonal planes to which you can express your failure criteria. And this is the non-interactive. They are all boxy. You just go through the strength parameter as you measure them. Then there is the Hashim failure criterion, which is really a partially interactive on the strength failure on the sigma x, sigma y, they're boxy, and sigma x and sigma shear is boxy. But in the sigma y and sigma s, shear is an interactive. In other words, it is elliptical rather than a box. So for the so-called tensor polynomial, the Hoffman criterion, and you can see these are all interactive because they are not boxy, they're elliptical, and they're single valued as compared with the boxy, which are multiple valued. And this is the Tsai Wu failure criterion. And the interactive term is minus one half. So when you express the failure criteria in a, as a scalar products, you can expand into the sigma x, sigma y space, and then you can show the coefficient of the failure criteria as related to the strength parameters are indicated here. So then you can rewrite the failure criteria in terms of the five strength parameters which we mentioned. And the comparison with data, this is a work by Hinton and Cador, and this is in the plane sigma x and sigma y, and uh, this is in the plane of this sigma y and sigma s, the shear stress. You can see that it is really difficult for to get combined stress tests, and, and uh, but approximately uh, these were measured by uh, by them and seem to agree reasonably well. And there are other published data based on the uh, quadratic. We call it quadratic because you have this the second order. And then these are the various materials, and they show the interaction terms. And the theory is in the solid line, and the uh, data are in the dots. And this is also the data by uh, Professor Horowitz. And this is the off-axis test. In other words, they use the coupons at various angles from 0 to 90. And then you can sh see the theory and as compared with the dots. And these tests are very difficult to do because uh, when you have off-axis tests, you have a shear coupling coefficients 
particularly in the sh shallow angles, in other words, in angles between uh, 0 and 45, and, and they're ex extremely difficult to do. And uh, But nevertheless, give you some indication, indication the trends uh, as compared with the theory uh, as we have shown here. So what we're trying to do is to learn what failure criteria can do so that we can understand the material behavior and to, to be able to devise a testing procedure for the purpose of design. One simplification that we recommend is to use the Omni envelope. Omni envelope is an envelope in strand space of all ply orientations. Then the inner core, inner core of that space happens to be isotropic because it's no longer in the, dependent on the ply orientations. So we have examples of AS4. This is a T4708, then IM7977, and T800 SciTech materials. So these are four representative materials, and, and the IM7 and then T800 represent the high end, whereas AS4 represent the low end, and the this T4708, uh, it turns out to be the average of the high and the low. So we later will call it masters because everything is the master that represents the average of all the envelopes. So what we have, we have two criteria. One is for first ply failure, then for the last ply failure. As you can see, in all cases, we show all ply angles from 0 to 90, to 0 90 in strain space now. In strain space, because the strain space, the failure criteria are independent of the ply orientation. So it is it is a, a material constant, so to speak. So you can see the first ply failure, what the inner envelope should be. And also you can see in the last ply failure, in the lower is what these values are. Now, it turns out that for the last ply failure, for all carbon epoxy composites, the only dependence is, is a zero and 90 ply orientation. They are the dominant, whereas all the other ply orientations does not really matter. And whereas in the first ply failure, the controlling ply varies as you go around the failure envelope. So that for the last ply failure, the last ply failure, which is really the ultimate, you only need to know the uniaxial tension and uniaxial compression uh, in our notations x, x primes. So it's a much simpler for you to do that. Now, this being the isotropic space, then you can find out what the shear strength is. Shear strength will be the 45 degrees. In other words, along the minus 45 degrees, and that is where tension and compression are equal. So that in the failure envelope, in the last five failure, we not only know what the uh, zero, uh, this is a zero tension at this point, and this will be the zero compression at this point, and then the shear will be at 45 degrees, so the circles here are the shear strength. And therefore, you're able to find out what we call a radius. We find a radius of the area we, we find out the area of the failure envelope is a key parameter, and the equivalent area of the failure envelope as it replaced by a circle, the diameter, we call it the R value, for various materials. And it turns out that there is a master materials. In other words, you take all the failure envelopes the omni, omni envelopes, and take the average, and this will be the average value. And then for any specific materials, then we will just multiply by the particular 
scale parameter of that material. So it becomes very simple, and we'll try to explain that more. And what, what we're trying to do is this. In the blue, the blue is a failure envelope. This is a particular material, T800 SciTech, and we're, we replace, we find the area of the blue, which is a failure envelope, replace it with a circle, the circle in red, and the circle in red having the same area as that, and, and the radius of that is R, the R value, which in this case turned out to be the average of the profile of the failure envelope, if you plot on the curved linear coordinates. And, and also the center, the center is displaced. The center, this is the new center for the uh, circle. And as you change the laminate from say 75 and 15 to 45 and zero, and you can see the shapes are different and, and the R values are different. So the R value is what we're trying to do is, in other words, it represents the area of the failure envelope. So you, if you plot all the carbon epoxy composites, we work with 15 representative materials. On the top, these are the failure envelope for the first five failure. These are the omni envelope now. On the bottom are the last five failure of the 15 failure criteria. Now, if you normalize both these failure envelopes by its radius, in other words, the radius is represented by the area, you normalize by its own area, then you can see what appears to be a random shapes into a more uniform shapes. And you can see that they are collapses onto the uniform shape. And the average value of that, in both cases, as, as you can see, is what we call a master. So therefore, this is the master, the resulting master failure envelope. And then for each individual failure envelope of material, you, you need to know what the scale parameter is. In other words, what the area is relative to the master and also the center where, where, where the envelope is referenced to. So you only need, you can go back and forth and therefore you can measure failure envelopes of all materials on the same scale. So that is what we're trying to get at. In other words, all failure envelopes are related and that all laminates are related. So the way to do that is to, first we show the double, 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 double is a case when we have two angle plies. In other words, a laminate, instead of using the quad, we will use a double, double. In a double, double, then we can find out what the R value is, R value is for say 10 different laminates and say, six different materials. And these are materials from uh, carbon epoxy, three carbon epoxy, then the carbon thermoplastics, and glass, e-glass, and the flex. So these are the materials. These are the R values. You can calculate the areas of the failure envelopes for 10 uh, laminates. Then you can normalize it. You can normalize it by materials or can normalize it by laminates. So that uh, provides a laminate rating and, I mean, I'm sorry, material rating and laminate ratings. And these ratings, you can see in terms of coefficient variation, they are very, very accurate. They're some is about a few percentage, a 3% average, and this also, in the laminate rating is, again, uh, two or three percent accuracy. So if you plot the laminate rating, and this is what the laminate rating will look like, and you can plot the, uh, I'm sorry, material rating on the left and the laminate rating on the right. So what, what it shows that for each material, you have three carbon epoxy, T800, the master, 
and the T T three hundred. They're independent of laminates. In other words, the ratio between two materials, in other words, material, one is 20% stronger than the other materials. It's 20% stronger for all laminates. In other words, any laminate you want, they will be the 20%. So that you want to test the relative strength of two materials, you only need to test one laminate say the best laminate you use will be 090 laminate. So all other laminates between the two materials will re remain the same ratios. And that, that makes it very, very easy to test. You don't have to test every material. You want to know the difference between two materials. Only one, one laminate will do. Uh, conversely, when you talk about the laminates, these are laminates. Each laminate has, say, uh, I show five materials. So that, again, is independent of materials. In other words, if one laminate, say 090 laminate versus quasi-isotropic, say the ratio is about 1.3, then it's 1.3 for all materials. In other words, every materials between the two laminates are the same. So that laminates in, in our formulation makes it much easier to understand and you don't have to test all materials or all laminates because that's an impossible task. Then the question, how many do, would you test? The answer is you only to, need to test one for calibration or one for confirmation, and, and, and you will get the ratios of the ranking. It becomes very important. So, so you need to know from the failure criteria, and we find out the area of the curve, use that as a parameter and from which you can establish the material rating as we have here you can establish the laminar rating as we have in here so this is for the double double laminates if you want to use the traditional 10 ply quad laminates and this is the 10 quad these are the 0 90 plus and minus 45 these are the percentages percentage 0 percentage plus or minus 45 and percentage 90. And you can do essentially the same thing. And you have the laminate ranking. And it turns out the laminate ranking of, of this material and that of the double double are the same. In other words, they're independent of, of the particular laminate you use. A ranking, in other words, a material, this material is 20% higher than that material. It doesn't matter you, you, you're you using a quad laminate or you use a double-double, and that should be the case. And on this side, it shows that what happens in the laminate. Again, it shows that if a material rating, ranking tells you that it applies to all laminates, and for laminate ratings, in other words, laminate A versus laminate B, if the ratio is a fixed sum, and that fixed sum applies to all materials. So what, what do these things look like? This gives you the overall view, overall view of the failure envelope, of the master failure envelope now. The master happens to be this, this particular material. And it shows the double-double angle. You have two angles, 0, 15, 30, and 45. And that's one angle. This is a plus or minus 15, 30 out to 90. So these, these are the failure envelopes. And the blue is a failure envelope. Red is the circle having the same uh, area. As you can see the shapes, there are really two types, two types of laminates. One is a hard laminate. Hard laminate is when the angle difference is greater than 45. We call it hard laminate. Hard laminates are those which have very strong in-plane that resistance to dilatations, you know, in other words, change in sizes are for the hard laminates. Then we have a soft laminate. Soft laminate is when the delta is less than 15, and these are area. And the, when the delta equals 45, and that is a demarcation, and so you, the soft laminate are one for shear. In other words, resistance to change in shapes, you would use laminates in this part 
And for those who are changing the size, the size of your structure, then you would use a hard laminate. So, so in the double double is very good. It gives you not only area wh which laminate should you use, and, and in fact you can plot. You can plot the R value, you know the radius for for all these laminates. You have two angles, plus or minus one angle, plus or minus the other angle, and these give you the radius. The radius is equivalent to the average strength the average strength of that particular laminate. So you have the master here. There's a master here. Now, we always refer to the 0 090. This is the 0 090. This is a 0 090 laminate with an average strength of 1130. And here is everything normalized relative to the 0 090. So that's what we say. If you want to test materials, you only need to test one laminate, any laminate you want, because you know the, the ratio. All the ratio are typed in, in here. So that if you do it the 0, 090, and if that is unity, and that tells you all the other laminates, what the strength will be relative to that. So, so it is much more orderly. And, and so you can test now for confirmation or scaling rather than what people now do. They say they have no idea what the strength is for any given material, any given laminate. And they say they test enough of them to get an A allowable, B allowable. That, in fact, will be the truth. Now, that we call blind blind testing, meaning have no, no uh, expectation of what the value is. And we say that's not really right. If you have some expectation of what it should be, it would be so much easier for you to measure if it turns out to your expectation, then you don't have to test thousand specimens. Maybe a few dozen will be enough. And here, here is an example again. We have a what, what we call a universal strength between any two laminates. These are two laminates. In other words, we have a a 0 090 laminate, and we have a quasi-isotropic laminate, and these are their properties. And then you can see they're independent materials. You know, the ratio is something like 1.3, 1.4, and this are, shows all the materials. These are all the materials. This is a flax, and this is the highest carbon epoxy, the, the newest hexel uh, T1100. And here is, again, we'll talk about the rating, the material rating. The material rating is related to X, that's uniaxial tension. X prime is uniaxial compression. So we take the average of the uniaxial tension, uniaxial compression of all carbon epoxy materials, and we plot it against the rate, the ratio, the R value now. R value is the area, the average value, and you can see they they are they are along the same line. They're very accurate with the low material T three hundred here, with the high material T eight hundred, and the average material is uh, T forty seven. So the diff the average value we call that master, a master from which you can scale all the others. Now this shows the laminate rating. <clears throat> laminate rating it turns out to be the four intercepts, X, zero tension, zero compression, transverse tension, and transverse compression of the laminate now. This is laminate happens to be zero and, and 60. And this is the master, as we have shown earlier. And then you can plot it. And you can see this is the R value of various laminates versus the average value of the intercepts. See, the intercept you can measure, and combined stresses are very difficult, and, and uh, the accuracy often comes in doubt. So that you can see the failure envelope provides you a, a opportunity to understand what the value should be, and, and then the determination for the design allowable will be much easier if you have some 
expectation what what these values should be. And therefore, you can show this is a, again the material rating. This is a laminate rating. So you can plot, for example, three laminates, 30, 15, 0, 60, 30, and 0, 90. And three materials. You can show three AS at the low material. This is a high material. This is the average material. And these are the failure envelopes of these materials, three materials and three, three laminates. And, and it shows that they're all related. The ratios, the ratios are fixed because of the rating. And they are, this is the rating. And this is a reference for the laminate. This is a high. This is a low. And for the materials, you can go here. This is the average. This is a high. This is a low. And this tells you this is a high material which are 1.25. This is a low material, so 0.75. And this is the average material. So that the, the 15 different materials, carbon epoxy, are listed in here. Again, this gives you an idea. You only need to measure, for example, one material from which you can scale all the others. And so if you want to know how good this material is, at least you, you have some idea this ratio is 1.25. In other words, this is 25% higher than this. And this one is 75% uh, of that. So you, having an expectation is, is very important. And so that in the determination of properties, it becomes much easier to do. So how good are the accuracy of the this is, in other words, there are only three parameters you need to know. You need to know the longitudinal stiffness. You need to know the longitudinal tension, longitudinal compression. So you only need the three, and you can derive all the last five failure. And then you can measure the for each laminate the uniaxial tension and uniaxial compression. So we have plotted in here three laminates. These are quad laminate, hard, quasi-isotropic, and soft, and four materials, IM7, and this, master, and T650. Uh, and and the red is, is the failure prediction, the omni envelope. The circles are the data, measured data. And you can see that they are very, very consistent. And then they have additional data in here. And we can also <clears throat> measure the open hole and tension open hole compression. We just arbitrarily say the effective stress concentration is factor two. So we plot the failure envelope. Red is the no holes. And the, the blue is the one with open hole. And then we have the data in red for the red and blue for the blue. And then at least it shows that to what degree uh, these predictions are met. So in conclusion, the failure envelope, first of all, are empirical, but allows you to have a simplified version. One way is to use the omni envelope. In other words, you only deal with the inner core so that it is isotropic. It's a much simpler that is, when, when the material is isotropic, you can go from regular strain to principal strain and, and then become some material properties. So the, the second thing, the omni envelope give you the isotropic core and you give up. This is more conservative than what it really is, but it allows you to go to principal strain because it is the isotropic space. And the last five failure prediction needs only three parameters. In other words, you don't need the other three 
uh, elastic constant, nor do you need the, the other uh, three. You don't need the transverse uh, tension compression. You don't need to do the shear because those compression, uh, the shear test in particular is very, very difficult to do. It, it's not, not only difficult, it's not very reliable. So, so it, much better off in, in our approach, we don't need to measure the shear. And it, because the isotropic space and then the shear becomes plus or minus 45 degrees. So then the radius R is a good parameter. That is an equal area of the envelope so that you have a single parameter that allows you for the ratings. So, so if you have more than a single parameter, then you cannot do an easy rating. And then material laminates are equivalent and then can be rated. And then scaling possibility, need to test only one panel, for example, in 090. And design and manufacturing can be simplified by homogenization across the thickness and across the entire domain. Then finally, a new technology can reduce the weight and it can simplify design and manufacturing and testing and increase the quality. So that is my presentation and I would be happy to answer any question that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Dai. That uh, we, and for the audience, if you have questions, please uh, type into the question and answer box. And uh, we do have a question from Dr. Kim Parnell. What's the, what's the significance of the area of the failure envelope, Professor Chai? Well, the significance of that, it gives you one parameter. In other words, uh, if you know the area, area of failure envelope, which is very easy to do. You All you have to do is integrate the area. And then you find out uh, if you know the area, and uh, there are different ways to represent the area. Uh, we decided to use the, uh, a circle of the same area and, and use a radius as a single parameter. If you use that as a parameter represent the strength, it is uh, the average strength, so to speak. In other words, you, you have a failure envelope. The R value is really the average strength of all the, if you do the uh, uniaxial tension test around 360 degrees. So you, the average strength turned out to be a good parameter that allow you to do the ratings. So you can rate materials and you can rate laminates. And that is why we use that. And we're not aware of any other parameter uh, that can do as much and, and uh, as we have to with our value. Thank you. Hope that explains why we use R. Yeah, I saw you that you reduce, I mean, you use the omni uh, envelope to kind of like simplify the laminates composites into isotropic, but we also know even for isotropic materials, they have many different failure criteria. So what the uh, uh, type of failure criteria you reduce to, is that the maximum strain or maximum stress or Tresca or Formesis, how close uh, to those one, or they are very different? Yes, we, uh, what, what, what happens, we, we use Tsai Wu. For example, here, the blue. The blue, this is for this material, T800, and for this material. And you can see the difference between the actual failure envelope based on Tsai Wu versus the radius, R. And, or, or you can see on this plot, you can plot on a linear scale, the failure envelope is red and the average value is, is R. Okay, you just integrate it, the average value. You know, we, so we use the average value. The question is, suppose we don't use Tsai Wu and, and uh, you, can, you can still do the approximations. Here, here is a, here's a omni envelope. Now, for the first five failure, if you use maximum strain, there'll be quite a difference between 
but but the method is, is applicable. And, and for the last five failure in the lower the, this this part, the last five failure, they 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 they're very similar. In other words, there isn't that much difference between materials. And then, and then if you change this, you can see the maximum strain. The maximum strain will be the same. You draw a box. The maximum strain for this this material will be like this, right? And that's your maximum strain. So that will be essentially very close between the two. This will be the maximum strain. And the maximum strain will be here. So we work for maximum strain. And we haven't tried the others, but I think it will probably work just as well. Well, I'd be very happy to do that, but but you can see intuitively the maximum strain and, and the prediction of side will be very very close. Yeah, you may already answer this question. They say they ask that how does this approach transfer to other fiber matrix composites, say glass, glass epoxy, or or others, can also yes. be used to predict cyclic load failure or not. Yes, uh, we can. We we tried uh, different different materials, uh, uh, glass epoxy and uh, flex, and uh, high modulus, and they 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 work. They all work. They will have a different different R values, but within each material system, say E glass and S glass, they all have the same parameters. And, and fatigue is is different, and uh, <clears throat> so you, you, you can do you can do what Hashim did in the fatigue. In other words, instead of using X longitudinal tension, longitudinal compression, you assume the static strength transfers to fatigue strength. Then you just use the fatigue strength if there is such a such a way. Or you use a residual strength of a laminate after fatigue, and you you need only three parameters. If you assume the ex, whatever the longitudinal stiffness is, and then you only need two parameters: x and x prime, uniaxial tension or fatigue, or uniaxial compression fatigue. And then, then you can you can plot this curve. You can plot this curve. And say this is the maximum strain, and say if you do the fatigue, fatigue I'll say will be something lower. Fatigue will be something like this. Then you can rate materials. And you can rate laminates, and that that's very important because right now in the design allowables, uh, they test three or four laminates. Uh, they test uh, quasi-isotropic, then they test a hard laminate, then they test a soft laminate, and maybe they test 090. They use 090 to, to extract uh, longitudinal tension of compression. So, so they do the four tests, 090, quasi-isotropic, hard, and soft. And then they test a different temperature, hot, wet, cold, dry, and then test a different batches. And so very soon you test a thousand specimens. And it costs you millions of dollars in uh, two or three years. What, what that strategy uh, does is to prevent you from introducing improvements in materials, improvement in processing. In any improvement you do, if you don't have the design allowables, and then the designers will not use it. And I think that is a, a terrible thing for, for composite materials. And uh, resistant to changes because of the fixed idea of a design allowables. Now, if you believe in the ratings, and that will allow you to scale, and you only need one test. 
If it doesn't show up there, that means whatever you do, it makes no difference. Or whatever the difference shows, if the strength goes up 10%, it goes up for 10% for all laminates and for that materials. And for, yeah, so, Professor, so, that, thank you. That's, that's a great answer. We still have a few questions not answered yet. Uh, please contact me. I can forward these questions to you. Uh, to Professor Zai, and he can answer it uh, offline because our class have a fixed schedule. We need to wrap up here. And uh, I really appreciate all you taking time to attending Professor Zai's lecture and especially thank Professor Zai to, to give us this wonderful lecture and uh, also educating our future composite engineers. And thank you, Professor Zai. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I'd be happy, very happy to answer questions anytime. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.